graduate Honorable Presidential Deputy Envoy from the U.S. State Department. Julia Neshwait is the Presidential Deputy Envoy for Hostage Affairs, strengthening diplomatic efforts to secure the safe return of Americans held hostage overseas. Working closely with the families of American hostages, foreign governments, and inter inter interagency hostage recovery, recovery fusion cell, she represents the United States on hostage-related issues. Previously, Dr. Nashwait was appointed as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for implementation in the Bureau of Energy Resources. She also serves as a political military advisor and visiting professor at the U.S. Navy Postgraduate Schools of National Security Affairs Department. Dr. Neshwait has held numerous positions as Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor to the Under Secretary for Economic Affairs and U.S. Special Envoy for Euro-Asian Energy Security. As you can see, she has many special areas. Every time I ask her to speak, she said, which area you want me to cover? I said, your specialty. Then she said, I have many areas. Earlier in her career, she served as the Chief of Staff for Policy and Planning in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, where she managed the integration and collaboration of analysis and reporting with all intelligence agencies. Prior to that role, she was selected to serve on the U.S. Presidential Commission on Intelligence Capabilities Regarding Weapons of Mass Destruction, leading the North Korea and Iran Policy Steering Committee from 2004 to 2005. And she is a former U.S. Army military intelligence officer and had worked in Afghanistan and Iraq. Let's welcome Dr. Julia Nashwait, Presidential Deputy Envoy from U.S. State Department. Let me just raise this up a little bit. You hear me okay? Great. Well, thank you again for having me uh, here today. I uh, want to give a big special thanks to Kennesaw State University, first of all, for hosting this amazing event. Uh, this is now my second year in attendance, and I look forward to hearing more and more about the momentum of what we can do in the, in the future as, as this continues. Um, definitely a special thanks to Dr. Mega for her vision, her energy, and organizing all of this. I know sometimes it's like herding cats, getting everybody together, but uh, it's tremendous and such, such an important time to be able to, to bring everybody together and your staff as well. Also a big thank you to uh, Dr. Ken Harmon, the provost, and all the sponsors here today who helped put this together. Again, um, this is such a remarkable time to really talk about economic growth and from a public-private uh, standpoint and partnerships. So as I mentioned, this is my, my second year here now at, at Sao Po, and I have to say I do notice something different than the past year. Um, and it's not just the venue. In fact, uh, if you look to your left and your right, you'll notice that um, there are more women here today. And I thought that was very impressive. And I think it's wonderful to see such diversity. Uh, it's very important. And I know my former boss, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, would certainly be pleased of that. So um, something to, to make note that we're starting to see more and more women in leadership positions, in management positions, in business sector. And I think it's very important to recognize that type of diversity. So as May mentioned, I, I do wear many hats. Um, I, I've worked everything from you know military, Department of Defense issues for the past 20 years, um, economic affair issues, energy, climate change, environmental issues, and just recently, uh, completely opposite topic, working on hostage affairs and counterterrorism issues. But one thing I will say, uh, as a government employee, you, you have to be able to um, wear many hats in the sense of understanding what national security is about today. There's this big umbrella, and it's all very much interconnected um, in any type of security situation. Uh, so being able to see that interconnectedness is, is, is extremely important from a strategic standpoint. Uh, but looking back over my government career so far, uh, I have to say my most memorable experience has been uh, living and working in Japan. 
Uh, I lived in a small coastal uh, area outside of Tokyo called Kamakura. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's right on the beach, very beautiful. Oh, wonderful. Um, so I was there, uh, part of the State Department, but also doing a, a research fellowship on energy and nuclear power. Uh, this was between 2010 and 2011. And um, I remember walking outside with my dog, and then all of a sudden just, he started barking, and um, this big rumble just kind of appeared out of nowhere. It was March 11th, 2011. And I hit the ground, and I looked up, and I saw buildings just swaying from side to side. I'd never been into in, involved in an earthquake in my life, so this was <laughs> quite a surprise. It was a 9.0 earthquake, and just little did I know, only 120 kilometers just north was this big, black wave of devastation with the tsunami and, and what it did uh, to the villages and communities. But I have to say, looking back, it's, it's been tremendous. One, because I learned so much about the resiliency of, of the Japanese people, of the government, of how, uh, from a humanitarian standpoint, people come together. Uh, so it was an interesting time, especially since, like, as I said, I was focused on energy issues, at, and, and so it was a critical time to understand, especially what the role of nuclear power has played back then and even today. It was such a wake-up call for, for the world overall. Anyway, I'm very grateful uh, on some of the experiences I've, I've had, and I hope we will have time for a Q&A later on about um, some of my experiences and any questions you may have. I'll cover quite a few issues, but tonight, today I'd like to really focus on um, an area that I've, I've had a lot of experience. Um, in fact, I re recently, well, a couple years ago, re reached uh, um, my academic peak with Tokyo Institute of Technology focused on clean energy technology uh, in the age of climate change. So that's going to be my main theme t uh, this afternoon. But before I go into that, I'd like to first talk about this conference a little bit more and why I would attend something like this, why all of you should continue, especially for, um, from a government standpoint. Um, why is this important to come together? Uh, as you probably already know, and it was mentioned earlier this morning, you know, this is such a unique forum in so many ways to be able to strengthen the relationships. I was just saying earlier, it's, it's quite a reunion to see even other faces where you're not able to connect during your day-to-day -day operations. Um, but a great opportunity to talk about investment uh, areas, of, particularly in the Asia region. And all of you here today, in one way or another, are a leader in your field, um, whether it's engagement with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, which we could talk a little bit about, um, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC, the U.S.-Asia-Pacific Comprehensive Energy Partnership, which I focused last year a lot on, um, and countless other agreements uh, which shape the world that we live in today. The Asia-Pacific region, for example, is it's certainly home to many of the world's most heavily traveled places um, and a lot of energy routes. Our economies today cannot function uh, unless there are, for example, sea lanes that have to remain uh, secure. So there's certainly a security element there. Uh, a conference like SAOPO uh, offers such a pathway, uh, in my opinion, to such great deep connections um, with industry leaders, as particularly in the Asian markets. So building those alliances, both from a public standpoint and a private standpoint, goes such a long way to have a, a security partnership that really will help guarantee um, that stability. And this isn't something new, by the way. We've, we've been building this and working on this for over 70 years. So uh, again, very remarkable, and I commend you all for being here today. But the theme I'd like to really focus on is as we look at trying to promote economic growth, we can't forget that security is inextricably intertwined with U.S. and Asian uh, economies. While we continue to try to build and strengthen our relationships with long-term partners, it's also important to look at emerging powers, to look at even the small to medium-sized type companies uh, as well um, to develop those new partnerships. From a terrorism and national security standpoint, I will say that we cannot lose uh, sight of the fact that this effort is only the beginning and the fight against violent extremism. And it's not going to be decided um, so much on the military or battlefield front, I would say. But actually, it can be fought in academia. It can be fought in the workplace, in religions, uh, community centers, as well as in government. So I see a, a very broad alignment 
when it comes to our strategic interests. Uh, when you look at various policies, and some of them will continue to evolve, there, you, you do see a, a strong commitment today when it comes to how we can cooperate and collaborate. Uh, whether it's in Beijing or Seoul or Washington DC or Tokyo or beyond, there are a lot of shared challenges as well as room uh, for that type of cooperation. And again, a, a venue like this is a great example that can br bring us together to promote that economic growth and really just have a better understanding of some of those challenges. It's not going to be easy as you try to build a path for uh, deeper uh, public-private partnerships. When you think of the global economy today, it's, some would argue it's still a little bit sluggish right now, actually. Um, but we can be those engines for growth. Uh, working with APEC, for example, or the G20, um, we, we really are positioned to do more. Implementing uh, various foreign, tra uh, foreign trade agreements, such as the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement, uh, negotiating a bilateral investment treaty with China, um, finishing and working on TPP, uh, which was signed actually this packed, uh, past October, but of course there's still more, more many, st many steps that have to be taken, including ratification. And, and from a U.S. standpoint, I believe next month there will be a report that comes out by our International Trade Commission to discuss the economic impact. So it's still a process, but it's something we continue to work on, and I would love to hear other, other folks' thoughts about this. Um, but at the end of the day, um, there are certainly the politics that, that come into play. It is an election year for us here in the United States. Uh, so it's a question of, I would say, more of when it could potentially be signed into law as opposed to if. But even if, if TPP were to come to more fruition, you wouldn't have to have all the countries. As I think the, the latest regulation right now is if, as long as six countries can sign up, um, that's what it would take uh, to further this. But at the end of the day, despite the politics aside, I would say that um, we certainly want to promote all trade agreements as much as possible. And I know, I, I think there's a, a Department of Commerce colleague here that maybe be able to talk about that a little bit more. Um, let's see. So I mentioned the, the various trade agreements. Uh, I want to now turn into another section of, of discussion that you hear a little bit uh, from time to time, and there's a lot of myths when it comes to the issue of climate change. Uh, the U.S. and China, no surprise, is the world's largest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. But we've had some recent actions, some positive steps um, to focus on targets that uh, show that we're really focused and determined to try to address it. For example, uh, I believe it was a year ago, uh, President Obama and President Abe pledged to the South Korea-hosted Global Green Climate Fund, about $3 billion and about $1.5 billion, respectively. And there were other countries that also uh, focused on R&D efforts, which were very important, and manufacturing capabilities that will keep us at the forefront of clean energy economy. Also, uh, we are major providers when it comes to humanitarian efforts. I shared with you my experience with a natural disaster in Japan. Uh, also think about you know, other natural disasters that have occurred, for example, in the Philippines with the super typhoon Haiyan, and many others that have occurred in, in Asia with earthquakes in India and Nepal and so forth. Uh, we're, we're trying to tackle a lot of these issues. And again, you'll see this interconnectedness when it comes to looking at a, a clean energy technology pathway and how we can be more resistant to the effects of climate change today, as well as looking at other related issues such as food security, water security, and energy security. Uh, other challenges I would think of, uh, given my travel experiences, would be if you think about the Mekong River Basin, for example, or the Pacific Islands, um, the South China Sea, obviously there's a lot of controversy there. We could, we could talk a little bit about that. Um, my recent experience uh, abroad had us focusing more on post-disaster reconstruction efforts, where if you're going to build back from the ground up, why not do it in a cleaner, more efficient way, as opposed to just bringing back the same infrastructure. So that's another area of focus that we can certainly build upon. And it's not going to just take, by the way, the government. There are many other stakeholders, and the private sector could lead the way on that. Um, so we have expertise, we have capital, um, a, a lot of other efforts that can help try to meet challenges. But I'd say my basic point really is whether we're focusing on a, a trilateral discussion or, a, or a, a multilateral basis, the fact is that we're entering an age of networks and interconnectivity. 
um, looking at new advanced technologies. I know we had an earlier session today about, about those uh, prospects and what that looks like. But essentially, we're not going to have any choice. You're going to have to collaborate and interact in one way or another. The major Asian powers in the United States needs each other as much as the rest of the world needs us. And it needs us to truly work together in that way. So to be able to try to jumpstart the global economy, to be able to preserve uh, regional stability, and to also overall enhance global security and protect the global environment. The U.S. and Asia relations are the most important relations in the world, bar none. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier, I want to also focus, as you may know, today is April 22nd, which is Earth Day. Um, this is where, it, it is also uh, celebrated internationally, but today it's, it's certainly celebrated in the United States. But just a quick fact, by 2050, the Earth will be home to an estimated 9 billion people. And many people means a greater demand for energy. So think about that for a moment. So this is a movement right now that's, that's occurring. And it's been about, I think we're entering now the 46th year of this movement as it continues, and, and hope, hoping to ignite motivation and investment to environmental protection. It was back in 1970, which was the first Earth Day, the movement actually gave a voice to looking at these global uh, security issues from an environmental standpoint. Um, and then here we are 46 years later, and we tried to look for other groundbreaking means or ideas uh, by leading by example, I would say, and promoting clean energy as well as energy efficiency, the low-hanging fruit. So no matter where you're celebrating today or overseas, um, it's certainly a message about not just personal responsibility but also corporate responsibility. And you all have heard this phrase about think globally and act locally. Well, that, that certainly comes into play as environmental stewards uh, for this planet. So that's something I, I certainly wanted to, to highlight. Um, there, there's plenty of data, whether you believe it's man-made or not, that there is climate change, it's occurring, um, there's overpopulation, um, and other critical environmental issues, which I'm happy to go into. But every person here certainly serves a responsibility to do as much as they can, especially with our finite natural resources. Uh, as, as we look at future generations. So let me now turn to some of the bilateral relationships we have, and I'd like to start with U.S. and China as an example uh, with climate change information. For those who, who are not familiar with, with climate change, just real quickly, climate change alone can trigger a state failure by worsening existing problems such as poverty, environmental degradation, ineffectual leadership, social tensions, and weak political institutions. Scarce resources can also contribute uh, to interstate conflict, economic migrations, um, as well as domestic instability. So all of these issues can lead to, here in the United States, our own national security issues, which makes addressing climate change uh, for us a U.S. national interest. And you've probably seen time and time again with President Obama leading the way on that. But let's take a step back. Okay, this is not just something that's occurring right now through this administration. Let's go back to 1979. The U.S. and China Scientific and Technology Cooperation Agreement was created between the U.S. Department of Energy and the China State, I'm sorry, China State Development Planning Commission, which had about 19 agreements on energy, including renewable energy, believe it or not. And currently, there's actually a biennial uh, report that does get submitted uh, to Congress, our U.S. Congress. So as time progressed, uh, there were multiple initiatives such as the 1985 Fossil Energy Protocol, uh, the 1993 China uh, the, uh, Protocol that established its first NGO, and that was called the Beijing Energy Efficiency Center. And then fast forward a little bit more, 1997 the first protocol for cooperation in the fields of energy efficiency and renewable energy as well as technology development. Uh, these were initiatives that targeted urban air quality, rural electrification, and energy uh, sources. So these were a, a very series of multilateral agreements. Fast forward again to 2006, you have the Asia Pacific Partnership on Clean Development and uh, climate change, and this is something I had raised last year, but basically focused internationally on voluntary public-private partnership. You had foreign environmental and energy ministers uh, from partner countries that came together and agreed to cooperate on the development and transfer of technology, which ultimately 
uh, enabled reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And this also works alongside, for those who are familiar with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. 2008, US-China 10-year framework for cooperation on energy and environment. Here it was created to address uh, pressing energy and environmental problems. It was one of the first multi-departmental initiatives, at least with the United States, you had everybody. You had the Department of State, you had the Department of Energy, Treasury, Department of Commerce, uh, Department of Interior, Transportation, Agricultural, as well as the EPA. Uh, as, and I'm sorry, and USAID. And on the China side, they had seven departments that were involved. So they all worked on an action plan focused on electricity, on water, air, transportation, uh, wetlands, nature reserves, to uh, protected areas and energy efficiency. A year later, 2009, you have the US-China Clean Energy Research Center. Their main goal is to provide research and solutions for the US and China, um, mainly looking at their biggest problem, which many of you, it shouldn't be a surprise, it's gonna be coal. Uh, looking at coal technology, uh, energy efficiency as well, but focused on clean vehicles as well as uh, other uh, energy resources and trucks. And then here, and then uh, this past December, uh, the COP21 in 2015 in Paris uh, was a very ambitious domestic climate uh, policies that were brought to the table, overhaul in, in the power sector and industry. Then we have the Clean Power Act of 2016 to reduce carbon pollution uh, from the power sector by 32% by 2030. And then China launching uh, a national emissions trading system in 2017, uh, at least that's when it's supposed to come out, which is similar to America's cap and trade system. And then an overhaul focus in transportation where you have new heavy duty vehicle standards for both the US and China. Um, so you're seeing a lot more of that, of that research and that focus and these commitments um, even in areas such as smart cities or, or eco towns, if you will, and then the notion of um, various uh, technologies when it comes to the nuclear industry. The U.S. had commit, committed to 20 new efficiency standards uh, for appliances, equipment um, by the end of this year, and will cut about three billion in metric tons. There's also climate change finance. Um, we've committed already now to about three, another three billion, and I believe China has committed to about 3.1 billion to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, again, this is a, a multilateral funding plan to basically support actions in developing countries, and I believe the World Bank also has uh, similar projects. And actually today, in addition to it being Earth Day, uh, leaders came around to actually sign the climate change agreement. Um, Secretary Kerry was just in New York City, among many others. So it's a very historic moment for many reasons. Um, agreeing to assist in a, basically a Swiss, swift transition, if you will, to low carbon climate resilient economies. So I mentioned this timeline and going through some of the things that we've done, the commitments, the conferences, the protocols, what does that really mean? Uh, what about the implementation? And I think that's gonna be the key. Where, where's the action here, right? Um, what, is it, what does it look like? What does that implementation look like? Uh, we do have the COP22 that will be uh, this fall uh, in Morocco. I've, I've been asked to speak, so if I see any of you there, please let me know. Um, but I think those will be some of the, the key uh, important issues when it comes to what has been implement, implemented, who's actually implementing. Um, the US and China, have, have they been able to take various actions toward these clean energy commitments that have been made ever since the late 70s? Um, and if commitments are not met, what does that really mean for the international community and, and those reactions? Uh, another quick area I'd like to focus on, and hopefully we'll have more time for, for Q&As, um, is the environmental side. Uh, I wanna give a little bit more detail, um, and I know you'll have a panel a little bit later from one of my colleagues from the Ministry of Interior who can talk more about uh, environmental issues. But with regards to environmental protection, particularly in Asia, um, it's, it's, it's very important that our work in Asia really focus um, a lot on population centers. Um, right now there's been a lot of efforts in the greater China area as well as in Indonesia. Um, but we, again, the theme is collaboration, looking at other countries such as Australia, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam will be critical. Our efforts in the region also supports our EPAs, uh, this is the Environmental Protection Agency's international priorities to try to help benefit the environment and public health that spreads all the way through the United States. Um, 
just a few examples also is in the ASEAN region and Southeast region overall. Uh, again, one of the most beautiful places in the world if you haven't been for any of my American friends here today. Um, but it's covered by a lot of dense jungle, if you will. Beautiful beaches, uh, incredible wildlife. Uh, it also has some of the great, greatest like urban centers, um, a lot of that recently been stimulated by uh, massive economic growth. Unfortunately, though, there's the act of pulling people out of poverty and then trying to uh, delve into a developed world, but it oft often comes to the expense of the local government. So this is true, really, uh, for all countries, uh, but it's very important, particularly to Southeast Asia, as their economies, especially in tourism, um, where it's deepened, uh, it really depends fundamentally on their pristine natural resources. Most of the environmental issues in Southeast Asia are extricably linked and working to boost one will have a benefit in some other manner or another. And just a few areas I'd like to quickly note. One, um, in endangered species conservation, uh, also deforestation. Uh, we were talking earlier about the Asia, Asian elephant, which has become, a, uh, there's been a, a great decline and that has occurred in places like Thailand. Uh, air pollution. This is a global problem, of course, but Southeast Asia does have amongst the worst air pollution in the world, only just behind East Asia and India. Um, thinking about how you can change this, of course, is not easy, uh, but to be able to conserve on energy, uh, whether it's in the office or home, uh, and try to push for maybe zero burn policies with various uh, companies or, or manufacturing sites. Uh, Another quick area, destruction of coral reefs. Again, I'm not going to go into heavy detail, but these are some of the ideas. Some of you may have heard of the Coral Triangle, for example, which has degraded over the years. Um, another way we can make a difference by ultimately reducing our carbon footprint, of course, thinking about biking or walking more than driving, for example. These little things make such a difference. Um, the other uh, area which I think is important is water security. We tend to forget the importance of water more than other typical uh, energy resources. The world is truly reaching a, a peak uh, water, if you will, and peak water meaning the point where we start consuming fresh water far more than it can be replenished. Uh, I can't help but think about the Himalayan glaciers, for example, uh, that source many of the rivers like the Mekong, um, and they are melting much faster. Uh, so let me just quickly close with the notion that, as we know, Asia is the world's fastest growing region uh, in, in many elements, in many ways. And by 2030, there will be about 3.2 billion consumers in Asia alone. Uh, many opportunities, both from uh, an energy and economic security standpoint, uh, for collaboration, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to boost economic growth, to create jobs, and to do this, though, and I, this is where I would really like to highlight, to be able to do this in a sustainable and environmentally friendly way. So with that, I would be happy to open this up to Q&As. Again, I wear many hats, but I'm happy to take questions on a lot of other topics if, if you'd be interested. So thank you very much.